I mean, Hello. what a day. This is like awesome. I mean, finally I meet you. You are here. By the way, do you understand what today is? Uh, it's May 19th. We're recording on May 19th. Do you understand what day it is? No, really. Tell me. It's my, it's my birthday. Oh my God. Are you kidding me? <laughs> it's my birthday. So I'm even going to take off my hat. I wear my hat often to cover the, the shine off oh, my head, oh, you know, so, uh, but I'm going to take the hat off for, for, uh, for, for recording purposes. Don't want to pattern you down. So. Piano from Transatlantic. I mean, we're so happy to have you on board, man. So Listen, I'm a huge fan of your series. I think it's uh, one of the most entertaining and insightful. Your questions are so, so beautiful. And uh, listen, I'm half Italian, so I feel <laughs> a connection to you as a brother, not just as a, a, a creative colleague. Amazing. So talking about question, I'm going to go through the seven questions, like the seven C's. And like, yes, sir. hopefully we can give like a side of you that's a little like few people don't know because I think so yeah. know about you and your career. And like, you know, I'm very excited. So let's go through the first question, okay? Okay. Good. Okay, this is a story of a Trans-Pacific journey. Before beginning the study of Apocalypse Now in the Philippines, Francis Ford Coppola gathered the film crew. He asked them to chant the word Kuaba three times in a row. The word Kuaba means to catch or take something from. Francis hoped to catch the magic. The film crew turned out to be one of the biggest crew to have worked on a set together. They all end up living in the jungle for months with all their families. Now, I read somewhere that as a WPP Goba CCO, you are the captain of a crew comprised of 1,200 creative directors scattered all over the world. Fortunately, you won't be on the messy set of Apocalypse Now. However, and there won't be any jungle involved. But if there was a chant or a word that you would like them to repeat before starting this wonderful journey, what would the word be? This question is an incredible question. And the story about Francis Ford Coppola is an incredible story. I had no idea the families lived there too for a oh, year. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's know? like just, um, you know, like all the kids from Rumblefish and like, yeah. you know, like um, like Dennis Hopper, like you know all these people that were living in the Philippines, like you know Martin Sheen, uh, kids yeah. were in the Philippines. So yeah, it was an amazing experience. I wish I was there. I wasn't. But well, it's, an, it's, a, it's it's an amazing movie, so it makes sense. Yeah. You know, I've I've thought about this, and I think you know I again I'm one for phrases, and there's lots of phrases that I left um, with with McCann left behind at McCann, you know, which I, an agency I love with all my heart and the people there, what a, what a ride we had. And I had lots of great phrases that are still on the walls and I'm super proud to, you know, at least been a part of that. But I, you know, I've been saying this a little bit, which is creativity always wins. Mm -hmm. So I feel that chant, okay. you know, cause everybody has to believe it, you know, for a shift to, to reach its destiny. And if everybody's rowing in the same direction, you know, you, you need you need that to happen. You need everybody going in the same direction. So I think creativity is the only, uh, oh, creativity always wins is such a good one because it is, you know, when we talk about, and I've talked about this a lot for, for a while now, governments are failing right. and, you know, it's going to be people and brands and that are going to end up saving. Brands with purpose are going to have this immense opportunity to continue to, to help people and save people. And then when you add creativity to it, it just fuels it, you know, and it just, it, it is the thing that I'm so excited about. Creativity is getting such a, it's being put on such a pedestal now, you know, in a sense of like, it's the world's most valuable asset. So I, I think chanting that creativity always wins would be what I would love that crew to do. I love man. I love the answer. You know, it's like, I always believe like the chanting, itself scientifically that's my science it actually slow down your heart rates so to mm, repeat like a sentence like uh, you know infinitely in loop is slow down it bring down it bring down your heart rate so that's why probably like you know when people pray or when people like do chanting before like a very tense 
like events, it, uh, it kind of like set up the whole body in a certain like, you know, mood and state of mind. So that's, I love, yeah. that. I love the creativity part. Good. Okay, good. Okay, the second question is quite funny and it's about George Carlin. Now there is a quote from George Carlin that I find fascinating and it comes with an interesting point of view on humankind. The man was like, you know, I'm forgiving on humankind. The best, the best. And it goes like this. The best thing about living at the beach is that you only have hassles on three sides of you. <laughs> now that's coming from someone who had a very little tolerance for bullshit. Your professional life puts you in front of people 24 seven. So your daily calendar must be full of meetings, which means meetings and meetings and meetings and maybe like an healthy dose of bullshit that come with it. So what's the behavior that you despise the most and find intolerable in your industry, in our industry? Well, being late makes me crazy, but I don't despise that. I just, I think it, it requires no skill to be on time. Uh, but that's not my answer. I think the answer is negativity that I despise. Mm. And that's coming from someone who, and I've talked about this before on a podcast of like, I think I, I'm a recovering asshole. You know, I think I, I used to be a, an asshole. So like people are recovering alcoholics or have eating disorders and they've always got to, you know, you're recovering from a lot of these things or fighting these things. And it happened when I was at CPB and we were the agency of the agency of the year and Alex had, had already retired from, from CPB and it was Andrew and I sort of at the, at the top of it with a bunch of other great, great people. And we had just won agency of the year at Cannes and, and I came back and almost got fired because people thought I was disrespectful mm. and I had to go to coaching for a year. Wow. And uh, I did it and I hated the coaching like anything. I don't like, no one likes to be told right. you're not great, but I, you know, I couldn't see, I couldn't get above myself or outside myself to realize that I wasn't being respectful to people. Mm. I thought I was helping people getting the best out of them. Right. And you were working at Crispin and we're agency of the decade and this is what you signed up for and it's hard. But I, I think I'm so happy I did that coaching for a year. I wouldn't have this job today. Mm. So the negative, so I'm a little bit crazy now negative, you know, like I don't, anybody who brings that negative energy into a room, you know, you're just hurting the process, the creative process. Right. You know, there's another phrase I use, like, don't be a speed bump. You know, <laughs> like someone asked me like, you know, how many people do you want in the room? I want anybody in the room who's not going to be slow it down. Like, of course the answer is going to be no on all these ideas we have. Of course it's going to be hard. There's not enough money. Or, or we can't get it done, but we need more people who are saying yes. It might never get done, but we can't be negative right. from the get-go. I don't want to, you know, please. And it's for coworkers, it's for clients, it's for everybody. Like that first answer should be yes. Then start interrogating, and maybe it ends up with a no. But I, I do think the more you know, sometimes the worse it is. Yeah. You know, and there's a phrase that used at CPB called delusional positivity. You know, we never learned. We never learned about these things. We just, right. we just believe we could do these things. And I try to bring that a little bit to, to McCann. And I'm bringing it hopefully to WPP, wherever I go. Again, I'm not shy about where I learned these things. I learned that, at the, to me, one of the greatest agencies of all time in CPB. Mm -hmm. I brought along some of the things that I believe, some of the philosophies that I've been taught that I think other people will, will benefit from. But certainly negativity is a thing that I would love to, to, to despise. And, and certainly our industry, it's easy to go there. It's hard. It's a hard business, you know, you so. Know, your definition of recovery hassle, say, so just like, <laughs> so I can't get my mind off that because I think that was like the outside Italian of you that's like creep in because uh, when I came to this country, for me, it was extremely hard um, to coach and like, you know, and credit directing people. I became a credit director like in this country. But as you know, Italian as a language, it's far more direct than American as a language, not just from a semantic point of view, but from a, a, a grammatical point of view. The construction of the sentence is totally different. So people yeah, like interesting. me to be extremely direct and too direct, too abrupt, too rough, when I was only using like an internal translation from Italian to English. Yeah. And now after many, many years, my wife is American. I learned like, you know, the lessons and like, you know, but it's always improving. But like, like, you know, sometimes 
sometimes like the perception comes home also like from these cultural differences that we have and uh, they are there and you can't just like overcome them you just have to go around them anyway man it's a great, but it's a, it's a great point because I, I think you, you bring up two things that are interesting. One, nobody wants to deal with assholes anymore. Yeah. It's, it maybe used to be able to throw a chair. You'd hear all these great stories. Not, and great, I, I'm being facetious with that word about, you know, creative directors throwing chairs or clients or, mm -hmm. and people being scared of, of this genius in the corner. I think those days are gone. You okay. have to be more collaborative. You have to be more understanding. You, you can't be an asshole. Somebody will get you. And it's usually people that work for you or below, you know, below you that will find a way to screw you up. Right. You know, nobody wants to deal with it. You've got to be what I call a charming provocateur. You have to charm everybody into your vision, your passion, your goals. Then you can be provocative. It's not the other way around. So, but the second point of, of coming from a different place and being a creative person in a, another country I'm embarrassed as an American that I speak one language and I barely am mastering this language, right? The English right. language. And I think it's incredible what people like you who have come to America and frankly, even in other parts of the world right. and are taking a language, which is not your native language and you've adapted it and learned the nuances of it Absolutely. to survive. Yeah. You know, that's such a, a noble thing that, and it's unfair because it's at some point it's like, well, that they don't speak as perfect English so they clearly can't be understanding our brand problem here in America, right? And, it's, and I, I give you a lot of credit and people like you that have come here and succeeded and, and try to fight through and, and, and certainly learn the language. And I wish I spoke Italian. It's killing me that I don't. And I know I'm 50, 52 today, so I don't know how much energy I have to learn some news. I'm trying, just trying to do this job, let alone learn languages. So. But someday I want to learn Italian, Italian and go to Italy and live there. Oh man, yeah, that, that's awesome to hear. Okay, third question. This is a story of water, resilience, and embracing the unexpected. Bruce Rogers, production designer for the Super Bowl halftime back in 2007, remembers waking up to one of those Miami storms the morning of the Super Bowl. He called Prince that was supposed to perform at the halftime of the Super Bowl and told him, it's raining, are you okay with it? And Prince replied, okay, you make it rain harder. Now, this shows an attitude of embracing risk like no other, but turning adversity into something good. Do you remember a particular time in your career when you took adversity, adversity and you run with it? What a great question. Again, these are like grand, grand prix of questions I've ever been asked. <laughs> Uh, I was at that Super Bowl with my wife. Oh, I saw Prince wow. live. Wow. It, it is still the most spine tingling goosebump moment I've ever been a part of. Oh man. It is, was incredible to, to see it on TV is one thing to be in that stadium in the pouring rain and watch this and watch this person with zero fear of electrocution. You know, we're all watching this like, how is this guy singing with a guitar, walking in these, and the, the dancers too, we're all wearing high heels. Go back and watch the dancers yeah, yeah. too, not just Prince, it's the everybody. dancers, how it's incredible. Just the fearlessness of Prince, I think is, it's such an inspiring thing. There's another great clip of Prince when he's playing with uh, all these other people doing my guitar gently weeps where he does this incredible solo right. and he throws the guitar up at the end and it never comes down. <laughs> it, you got to watch it online. Put in Prince, my guitar gently weeps. It's an incredible thing. So I was at that game and I remember that being inspired by that. I think, uh, listen, being told you're an asshole and having to re readjust and go to coaching, that's one thing. But way before that, what the, the time in my career where I took adversity and, and ran with it, I was working in New York. I was the acting chief creative officer of Hill Holiday. My boss, uh, David Weekel, amazing creative and a great mentor to me, he, um, he left and they sort of put me in the job as a temporary thing. And they said, you, you can interview for it, maybe you would do it. And I, I kind of realized I was 33 years old. I had all the skills of a CCO. Um, maybe I had the right attitudes, but I didn't really have the work, mm. you know, and I didn't want to be a creative director at 45 realizing I had this career where I've making a lot of money, but I hadn't really made an impact. I hadn't made the work I'd like. So I ended up, my wife, who was at Crispin at the time, 
small agency. CPB wasn't what it was, but it was this hot emerging agency back in 2003, I would say, 2002. And um, I called Alex Bogusky. He sort of knew me through my wife. She was a you know account person there. And I said, listen, I want to come. I want to start over. I want to start my career over. And he said, you make too much money. You have too big a title. I, I said, I don't care about a title. I don't care about the, the money. I care about getting better as a creative person. And I said, I'll cut my title down to copywriter and I'll cut my salary by 60% and start over. I didn't really give him a chance to say no. And then I said, listen, I'm going to send you my book. If you like it, then we can talk. If you don't, it's not a big deal. I think begrudgingly, he liked it. I had cobbled together enough good stuff over the years, but I had to work hard to squeeze out you know, some of that, that magic. And he saw enough in me that he thought, thought I would be valuable. And I, and I got there. And it was a terrible experience. CPB was probably 100 people at the time in Miami, very tight, you know, sort of us against the world place. And I was this outsider from New York, used to have a huge job, made, used to make a lot of money. My girlfriend was a star in the organization. And here am I, this New Yorker coming and had all the wrong clothes. It was like the time I had all the Prada clothes and the Prada boots. Everybody else had flip flops. I'm in black. Everybody's in, you know, you know, poppy colors. I just didn't fit in. And, and Alex didn't even give me a partner the first month. You know, he just really was making it difficult. So I feel like I'm walking on eggshells just trying to fit in and get some work done. And Alex calls me in his office about a year later and said, hey, listen, I, I'm sorry, about a month in, and says, hey, listen, I know you haven't sold any work yet. I know you're working hard. Uh, but I just want to say, I think you're awesome. And I love what you're doing. I love your work. Just keep going and do that. And I thought it was because, but here's one thing. Nobody else in the company likes you. <laughs> and I was, I mean, it's a, it's a huge ego hit when wow. your boss that you, you, you look up, up at as, uh, on a pedestal and you feel like you're trying so hard to fit in, but I'm a New Yorker. So it's like, no matter what, you just feel you're loud, you know? And I was so just gutted. I, I felt like I just got stabbed, that punch, stabbed in the stomach. And I remember going back to our apartment and talking to my girlfriend, who's now my wife. And I, I told her the story. I said, well, screw this place. If they don't want me, I've given up all this money and title to come here. I'm trying to fit in. Like, if they don't like me, screw them. And she, I thought she would be like, okay, fine. We'll go somewhere else, whatever. And she said, listen, you're being... I won't use the word she used, but you're being a wimp. She used a much more uh, forceful word. You know, why don't you try shutting up and just doing the work? And I was like, well, screw you too. You're part of this. You're, I don't want to be part of you either. And I went to sleep thinking I was going to resign the next day to Alex. Mm -hmm. And I woke up thinking like, I've given all this up. I wasn't raised by my parents to be a quitter. Mm -hmm. And maybe they were right. I went into Alex's office and said, listen, I've tried to sell my brand to marginal success over the last 10 years. I'm here to sell what you're selling. Uh, I got it. I don't think I spoke to anyone for a year. I just put my head down and started doing the work. And you know, then you, you get some success, you get a couple things that people like, you get some things produced, you come up with some big ideas and people start respecting you. And, uh, and then it was off to the races. You know, we won Burger King, I helped run that with Andrew and these things. But man, that was an adversity I, that I took and I ran with it, ran into it versus running away from it. And, you know, obviously yeah. it changed my life and changed my career. And, you know, that see, see, that's, that's why I do transatlantic. So I have this picture, I have this vision in my head. At one point, yeah. when I'm going to retire, I'm going to put the headphone and watch all these like transatlantic episodes. And oh, because, awesome. of this, because of this, and it gave me so much joy, you know, I, I interview like, you and like you know, I remember John Egerty and like you know Bozoma and so many other like you know great people, and each of you has a story that is so compelling, speaks so much to me. Hopefully, like to the people that are listening to Transatlantic, like this story, this story. Yeah, it's a great one. Title and like uh, you know, speak it to anyone for. I think it's awesome because I think like what people see in you right now, they only see success. They don't see. Yeah coming from they only see oh this guy had like it was like his career is a straight shot he never had any problem i don't know how many people know that unless like they are in your inner circle 
And so I, I love yeah. people to know this for like- And I, I've, 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 I've talked about the story before, so some people might know, but not most. And um, I didn't win my first lion until I was 34 years old, you know? Like, not that I didn't try, you know? But I will say my story is my, my story too, you know? Like, and I might not have asked for promotions or raises along the way, and I've always worked for people, but like, my story is my story. I think there are people that are in much different situations, people from diverse backgrounds that like, need to do it their way, need to, to ask for things, need to raise their hand and, and make a statement. So. I just want to make sure that people understand, like, this is my story. Absolutely. And everybody has their, their, you know, sort of life circumstances right. that you have to find what's going to be comfortable for you, too. Absolutely. So I just but want to make sure to make story, that point. People's story is like, uh, are like poems, right? When I hated it when I was, like, growing up, like, uh, and going to school when they make you, like, analyze poems. I think, like, yeah. it's one of the dumbest things ever. I mean, poems <laughs> should be uh consider it has like a mute keyboard you know when you have a mute keyboard that you need to put the sound and like you so you put the sound and become a synthesizer you know back yeah then. like you know yeah. poem is the same thing like you know when i read a poem it i don't need to analyze what the person was thinking i just need to like get the feeling that it gave me and put it in my journey and so mm. you talk about your episode for me this episode is like a mute keyboard. I'm going to put whatever you made me feel into my journey and mm. use whatever I made me feel. It's still my journey. It's not yours. Yeah. But the sound beats are into my journey now. So, and I can use as a motivator. So anyway. I love, I love that. I love that. For question. Thank you. When I think of sea, birds and wind, Tennessee Williams comes to mind with a remarkable monologue performed by Marlon Brando in The Fugitive Kind. It was a movie directed by Sidney Lumet and starring an Italian actress, one of the greatest we always had, Anna Magnani. In the monologue, Marlon tells the story of a special bird. And it goes like this. There is a kind of bird that doesn't have any legs, so it can't alight on nothing. So he has to spend his whole life on his wings in the air and he sleeps on the wind. That's what he does. It just spreads its wings out and goes to sleep on the wind. Personally, I find this piece of writing connected to my career path. It seems to me that the higher I fly, the less time I have to pause and recharge. So I must learn how to sleep on the wind. What in your life changed as your career took off? I mean, you are as high as you can get. Do you sleep on the wind? <laughs> it's a, I mean, it's an incredible. I kind of want to. I, I haven't read that. And uh, I kind of now want to watch. I want to watch the movie, read the book. Oh man! Read. I want to have you narrating the book. I mean, it <laughs> sounds so so good. And, and there is a story an, of Marlon Brando. And uh, before you answer, I can tell you this little. Yeah, story yeah, of course, yeah, monologue. please. So this part of the monologue where, like, Marlon Brando talk about like. He say there are three kinds of people, the one that buy, the one that get bought, and the one that like these birds sleep on the wind. And when he was actually reciting this monologue, they did 37 takes, because there was a point in the monologue where Marlon like stumbled upon because of his personal experience. And there is a part, a YouTube video where Sidney Lumet speak about that and say like, at one point Marlon asked me, Let's do another day. I can't do this. It was always the same, always the same point. He would stumble upon. And see, they say, no, Marlo, we need to deal with this. You need to deal with your problem tonight. Let's go through it. So they did 37 takes and finally did it. And see, the Lumet says, like, when he was done, he was so depleted that his shirt was drenched. Clearly, there was something that this man was struggling with. I mean, the story yeah. of Marlon Brando is like, it's a crazy story, right? But when you watch the video, I mean, there was a time in the American history where you had these great people. And when you put together Sidney Lumet, Tennessee Williams, and Marlon Brando, it's as good as it gets. And this piece of writing, unfortunately, this movie didn't win any Oscar, but this piece of writing was like unbelievable. It was the best writing of Tennessee Williams in the acting of Marlon Brando, but that story yeah. where he had to take 37 takes to go through that. And there was a point where he stumbled upon and it's fascinating to me. 
anyway. Yeah, it's amazing, amazing. Well, to answer your question, you know, which is what in your life changed as your career progressed? Well, it, I've always not, I, I've always said to anyone who's known me since I was probably 15, any, any girlfriend I had or anybody I would get serious with or was public about it, you know, within my circle of friends was I never wanted children. Oh, wow. And, um, and I think as, you know, when you're young, it doesn't matter. You're, you don't really know why you don't want children. And it's not like I had a bad childhood. I had amazing parents and loving parents, you know, and great friends and great grandparents. So I wasn't around divorce or anything like that. So it wasn't of that nature. Uh, I think it was about responsibility. Right. I think I never wanted the responsibility. And so as you get older and as you progress in your career, you realize, wow, I'm now a creative and man, having a responsibility is even more of a, uh, you know, more fear. Fear is the greatest debilitator of creativity for me. And other people think fear is the greatest motivator of creativity. I think for a creative person, fear or fear of you losing your job, fear of you losing your house, fearing, you know, am I going to be great? Am I all those things like, I, I think the less fear you have, the more free you are to just right. go for it. Right. right. That's just my belief. Again, people have their own. Tiffany Rolfe, my one of my best friends, she has the opposite thing. She thinks fear is the reason she does it. She's also a great mom. So maybe that's maybe that there's there's something to that. She would be a great person to do this, by the way. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll suggest it to her because she is quite, quite incredible. But you know, I've never wanted children. So as I got on in my my career, and especially when you're starting out when you don't have the confidence, right? And I didn't have the confidence. And we had talked a little bit about this before. And you were asking me, Robert Francis Riley is what's up on my screen here. But no one knows me as Robert Francis. Certainly no one knows me as Robert unless you speak to everyone I grew up with my whole life. Mm -hmm. Everyone up until my first job, my name was Robert. Okay. Always. Not Bob, not Rob, not Bobby, not Francis, Robert. And still to this day, you meet anyone from the past, they say Robert, they don't say Rob. Well, what happened was I lacked so much confidence. When I first got my first job at McCann, by the way, uh, as a junior copywriter, I worked, my mom got me the job somehow. She introduced me to someone who knew somebody. I worked on my book for a year, finally got the job, right? I was confident as a person. I was in a band in high school, uh, in college. I played soccer. I was a bartender. It wasn't like I was this, you know, you know, shy person. I was very outgoing and confident, but I wasn't confident in my ability as a creative, you know, and I ended up being so nervous. You don't know, have to go, go around the room and introduce right. yourself, right? It's still the worst thing ever, right? Where you have to go around the room when you're young, you just want to say, I'm, right. you know, um, Robert Riley and I work in creative. When you're a CCO, you have to be clever. You have to do something. I mean, it's, it's, it's still the shittiest thing ever, right? I just want to <laughs> fucking kill myself. No matter what level you get, it's just an awkward thing. We should just have a name tag that says what you do and what you are, right? right? It's so dumb. But I was so nervous about my ability as a copywriter that I would mumble my name. And I would say Robert Riley because it had too many syllables. It was an alliteration, but it actually was alliteration with syllables. So I went back to my secretary. Everybody had secretaries. Even juniors had assistants or secretaries back then. It's so crazy how the world's changed. And I said, I need new business cards. And I needed to say Rob Riley. And she's like, why? And I said, because it's gonna be easier for me to say in a meeting. Wow. And I'm forever Rob Riley, right? So I think I've always had this thing about you know, lack of confidence in my ability, maybe not as much now, but I think creative people are always lacking a bit of confidence. You know, you need to be reassured that you're doing well, you're great, all those things. But having children wasn't even on the radar for me as a young person. But as I got in my career, it, it, it wasn't even a, an option for me because I wanted nothing to stand between me and, and doing what I wanted to do and taking the job I wanted to take or making the decision from, hey, I've got this big job making a lot of money, I'm gonna quit and start over at CPB. Right. If I had children, I wouldn't have been able to do that. Hmm. So I think I've been rather selfish. Now my wife you know, might, might have wanted a child here and there, we talked about it, but I was adamant against it. And as I got older and older and more experienced and further along, like having children, I felt 
was going to really stop me from being fearless mm -hmm. and stop me from doing the things I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Not because I felt that, felt I was fearless. I needed that lack of any, you know, financial, you know, right. weighing me down or any kind of things or golden handcuffs or anything things where my kids' college education was wrapped up into it or my mortgage. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where I've been the most selfish and wanting no responsibility other than wanting to be great at being a creative. Wow. And maybe my wife has suffered from it. Maybe my life has suffered from it. Now you kind of realize that you, when you have these bigger jobs, your responsibility is everyone and their kids too. So I do feel a big responsibility. I, you know, I do do make some of the decisions knowing that there are people that have to, you know, that don't have the level of freedom that I have or don't have the freelessness maybe that I have or per, um, perceived to have. So I do think that's a big thing. The people that have children and are great creatives, I have such respect right. for, for what it takes right. to be fearless and to have conviction right. and to keep coming up with ideas, knowing you've got a, these other people that you've got to spend time with and do. It's incredible. And uh, I, I really have a lot of empathy for that. And I have a lot of empathy for clients who also have responsibilities right. that are saying, hey, just make this decision. Just go for it. Everybody wants to be fearless and make these decisions, but there's so much wrapped into these decisions. We've got to find the barriers of fear and start removing them to help yeah, these it's things a, It's such be a made. great story. Because like, you know, like for me, I had children very late in life, like, you know, like uh, uh, I was 38 when my first like uh, daughter was born. Um, and I have two little daughters now, like one is nine and the um, other one is like five. And uh, my main concern was to me, like, how would my creative path, pattern would change? How my creative thinking would change? And mostly writing, because I'm a writer. It wasn't my concern yeah. about advertising. It was about, like, how am I going to actually... Because I remember there was a story about Raymond Carver I read. Someone asked Raymond Carver, why do you write short story and never, like, a novel? And Raymond Carver replied, I have kids, I don't have time. That's why I write short hmm. story. I mastered the short story for this reason. So people think that Raymond Carver mastered short story because he was into short story. No, he didn't have time. He had kids, right? Hmm. So now what I think is uh, when, I had, when I had this fear, it was a fear that's like was a legit fear. But then when my kids were born, I noticed a complete shift in, creati in creativity in my writing. And it's not better or worse, it's just different. And I'm glad because I, I could experience like a different, like, you know, it was like I was looking at writing from left and then suddenly I, I go from like the right, like, you know, vice versa. Um, that was my story, but you know, yeah. I, I say to myself, like, uh, I believe everybody has a biological clock, not just women have a biological clock, like men too. And I remember I said, yeah. to myself, if I don't feel it, by the age of 40, I'm going to be saying no, you know? Um, and then yeah. night, it was literally overnight. One day I woke up, I was like, I want to have children. And, you yeah. know, the right person, like, you know, and, and so it goes. It's, anyway, it's I, amazing. It's, but I think it would be a really interesting, you know, session you do or a podcast somewhere or a series of, of the difference of creators, not just yeah. advertising, just creators uh -huh. with children and without. Without, and the, yeah, and what, what that means, because it's like, it worked for me in the end, um, but, you know, it's working for you too, you know, on yeah, the flip I mean, side, you know. You know like, so. in, during the pandemic, I began uh, this uh, book that I actually am, like, you know, I'm, I'm putting stories on Instagram, and it's called, like, The Quarantine Diary of, of a Savage Kid. And what I do, pretty much, I take, like, the question of my five-year-old and the thing that she said during this pandemic life, and I work into like a poetry form. So I, I wouldn't be able to do that. Like if I didn't have like children. Yeah. It's okay. But I think it's why I think it's why I'm also attracted to great uh, female creatives. Yeah. yeah. Because oh it's just like they often sometimes have ch children and we just hire this tailor uh, from Publicis to, to run Ogilvy, which is such it's an amazing yeah. she's an amazing yeah, person and le and leader and Debbie runs VML YNR and Tiffany's one of my best friends and there's so many great people at McCann, great female leaders. Like there, there is something where I'm just fascinated of how, how people multitask. And I'm not saying there aren't men with kids and, but you know, the, the women I know are really doing a lion's share of, of raising the kids. You know, it's, it's a hard thing. I think it's a maternal thing. I'm just fascinated by the ability to multitask and compartmentalize 
and, and be so efficient and so, uh, you know, the quality being so high within whatever, all they have that they're doing. So it, it, it's fa I'm fascinated by it. I have so much respect for it. And I think that's why the work is so interesting. Right. I think a lot of the work that comes from female led companies is, is some of the most interesting work in the world. And, you know, I think we just have to, that's why diversity is so important, not necessarily because we have to do the right thing. There's quotas, which of course we have to do, and we have to make big steps to move us forward, but it's always been about the quality of the work for me. How do we keep the work fresh and interesting? And I think, you know, my good friend, Amid Farhang just started his company called Majority mm. um, with Shaquille O'Neal. And he yeah. used to work, he was, he was my intern at Crispin and he's gone on to be such a superstar. But, you know, his belief is that, you know, diversity leads to the most disruptive creative ideas. Absolutely. You know, and he's, he's actually, he's, he's listed as a white person, but he's, he's from Iran. His name's Amid Farhang. So while maybe he's not recognized as a person of color, like if you don't think growing up an Iranian person in the 90s in Arizona named Amid Farhang is not a challenged life, you're crazy. So it's, it's, I'm, I'm so proud of him and what he's done, but I think he's onto something. And something I believe is that diversity does lead to the most disruptive creative ideas. Absolutely. And I think that's why we got to keep making our industry Diverse. filled with people that are not just people that look like me. Um, and I think it's going to be, a, we're going to be way better for it. That's great sign. That's a great sign of positivity, man. I love this. I love to hear that. Hey, fifth question. Even when yeah. turbulence is strong, it's one of the hardest things to measure in the ocean. Yet turbulence serves a purpose, which is why it is studied very, very carefully. The main function of ocean turbulence is to stimulate circulation. Otherwise, a massive amount of water will stagnate. Now, applying this to our life as a creative, our inner turbulence stimulates our deepest waters. It's not by chance that when we sit down and try to come up with an idea, we use the word brainstorm. We literally try to move something deep inside us. We stimulate circulation. What's the most beautiful turbulence you had inside as a creative in the past year? I mean, these questions, it, it, my head is gonna explode, they're so good. <laughs> um, and I wanna make sure I get this one right, but because right. it's like beautiful turbulence is, it's the combination of those words right. throw me off. A turbulence, I understand. The beautiful turbulence is, I'm, 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 I'm struggling to understand that, but so, I'm gonna um, give you, give me, maybe give me an example. You know, there is like, uh, you know, like there is a notion of like beautiful turbulence, beautiful pain. And sometimes like, even if you go to something that is like uh, perceived as a negative, as a turbulence or something painful, it's still beautiful. Uh, because like it can get you to the other side where it's sunny, right? So for instance, when I brainstorm uh, with myself, I come up with an idea, I use a lot of like my past, the mm. things that happened in my past. And some of these things are not actually pleasant or like, you know, I don't like to go there, but I want to go there because to me it's important then like to dive and get the idea. So it's no different from method acting. Middle acting, they teach you how to dive into your experience and truly like, you know, uh, dig deep, even if it's painful. I tell you this little story, which makes it yeah, please. apply. Mika Rourke, which is a great actor, unfortunately lost his way a little bit, but no, no, a, a few people know that he actually went to the actor studios. And according to Elia Kazan, which was a great director, he performed one of the best audition ever. His audition was like this. He needed to recite a monologue about a father and son. And he went to his acting coach and say, I don't know my father. I didn't grow up with my father. My father abandoned us. And his acting coach told Mick Rourke, if you really want to nail this monologue, how bad do you want to get into like the acting studio? And he say, really, really bad. They say, okay, then you need to find your father. You need to find your father face your fear, face your pain, and use that to recite the monologue. So he actually went back to the place, the only place, it was a diner in New York where his father used to go. And he found him there the night before the monologue. And he talked to his father. His father gave him a couple of bucks. He was very dry, very like sad. But the day after he went, performed the monologue in one of the best auditions in 30 years. 
that's beautiful pain. Amazing, amazing, you know? amazing. So that's what I mean. Okay, so now I understand. And it's a, now it's very helpful. I think this leaving McCann and everything that came with that was so difficult. You know, I don't think, um, you know, listen, everybody works at agencies and it's come and go and it, the opportunity this, that the, the WP, there's no other opportunity in the world like being um, the chief creative officer of WPP. There's no it's size and scale and the quality plus the media, the ambition, all, all that. It, it, it will be the most creative company in the world, right? That's my goal and Mark's goal. And I think we're going to get there. But I love McCann. I love the people there and I love what we did. So I think that was so painful to leave, you know, again, yes, it's a business and you have to do what's right for you. And, but, and, and frankly, I was asked to do something and we did it, you know, it was, wasn't the best and it was the best when I left, you know, and I think I was proud of that. I'm proud that the people I did it with, you know, I was one small part of a, a massive organization that was all going the same direction. And, but you know, Suzanne Powers, who runs strategy, she is literally one of my best friends, you know, and all these people were, you know, and Suzanne is still one of my best friends, you know, at least, but like these people that you consider you're very close with, you don't see anymore. And you, it goes from like, you are a leader or you are a, a, a force there and then you're not. Mm -hmm. And then all these people that you've really touched and they've touched you are out of your life in some ways because you know, the work you just, it's cut and dry. You know, and there are people that have left uh, that you just don't stay in touch with. Like, you know, and, and listen, I've got to mend some of those relationships that I've gotten. And I won't mention that a privacy to, for me and to some of these people, but one in particular where it was very close and it ended very badly, you know, and that kind of pain and that kind of um, whether I felt hurt or that person felt hurt, it doesn't really matter. There's just pain all around. Like that turbulence, you know, I had some months to think about it, you know, before mm -hmm. I ended at McCann and started at WPP. And I was like a racehorse ready to go, you know, because all these, these moments you're sitting there around looking at the water or trees in the wind. And during the pandemic, you can't go anywhere. Like you have a lot of time to be alone with your thoughts. Absolutely. And did you, did you leave people, in a bad way. I don't think I did, but maybe some people think I would, would done or abandoned things or like all these emotions go through your head. And luckily, you know, you, you realize like people are way stronger, you know, than, than we give each other credit for. And while I, I felt like I had a great impact on, on people there, like there's so many great people at McCann that like me leaving, they haven't missed a beat, you know, and whoever comes in there or where they elevate people, it's got to be fine. But I don't think people understand what it's like. And I'm sure Liz will go through the same kind of emotions and anybody else who's, who's left in especially a high profile job. There's so much connection you have with people. They're not just creatives and strategies and production. And I mean, one of the hardest things was saying goodbye to this woman, Judy Ferber, who runs the office. You know, she's like a second mother to me in this. Her name is Judy, which was my mother's name was Judy. My mother passed away, you know, this a few months ago. And like all these emotions are swirling around you and you start to realize, wow, it's not necessarily a family. It's about connection and then you have it. And the, the, those turbulent, you know, the turbulence and it's, yes, it's beautiful, but it's more a painful turbulence, but I, hopefully it comes out beautiful because my attitude going into a new organization is I am ready to give the love. I am ready to give any knowledge or positivity I have to make those people uh, successful and feel happy and good about where they work as much as I try to bring it to McCann. And I think McCann ended up being one of the greatest networks in the world, but I think one of the greatest places to work. And I'm finding WPP just my two weeks there. Wow. It, feels the same and feels similar and I hope to just continue that but that that is something is underestimated when you leave a company what that's that means awesome. that's actually the, the that's the answer I was expecting from you you know uh, when I extended yeah. the invitation to come on board there was literally like in a transition moment from like going to McCann from McCann to WPP so uh, I wanted to get this reaction from you yeah so, well we, were, we had to put it on pause because I I really wanted Jeremy Miller who runs comms you know he you know he had asked me he's like hey listen you know it'd be great if you don't do interviews yeah and I, and I hadn't thought about it and I said you know I respect that because I the last thing you want is to ever leave in a bad way so 
So I was respectful. Jeremy's one of my great friends. He's the best, one of the best comms people in, in the business. And he asked nicely, he said, hey, is there any way, you know, and I, and I said, yeah, absolutely, because there's going to be plenty of time for me to do interviews when I'm at WPP. Sure. And I had done a lot for McCann, and this was this weird moment of transition, yeah. but I try to stay quiet. I try to stay quiet on social media out of respect to both organizations. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, you, you just have to try to do the things the right way. We don't always do the right things the right way. Um, I, I, don't do, I, I certainly don't do them all the right way, but I try to. You know, and yes, we play within the margins within advertising, right? Of what's right. Everybody's trying to get an edge. But I think in the end, if you know you're a good person, you haven't done anything wrong, you can feel good about how you, you leave and start the different organizations. And, and, and certainly it, it goes both ways, too. I think there's, uh, you know, the industry's hard. I feel like we're all part of one big thing that we're trying to show that the power of creativity is valuable in the world. Absolutely. So I root for as many people as possible because it just proves that we're valuable, right? We're always talking about like how creativity is not valued in advertising and, and we're not, and our ideas aren't valued enough. Like we just gotta keep showing the, proving it and showing the examples that really impact. It's right, it's right. I gotta say something before I move on to the six questions. Yeah. I, 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 like, you know, I, I never met you, this is the very first time. Yeah. But um, there is always like, you know, when there is press release that you had, like you had tons of press release. So like, I saw your face like popping up like uh, everywhere. And normally they use always like the same pictures. But yeah. uh, I don't know why it's like, you know, when I look at your expression in the picture, it reminds me a lot of one uh, headline from uh, Jacques Segala. Not many people know, but Jacques Segala used to be a very great copywriter in France in France, and he was the one that did like the Mitterrand, Francois Mitterrand presidential campaign. And he used this slogan called the quiet force, the quiet mm -hmm. force. And I don't know why, like uh, with you, like, you know, every time I used to like look at this picture, you had this very calm expression, but still like, you can tell that there is force behind. And mm -hmm. it always, always like go back like to that, expression of Jack Segalade by force. So I think that's, uh, I like because like, you know. Well, I, I love that phrase. I'm not sure I would be yeah. classified as quiet, but I think, I, I think it's important that you make sure that everybody who's made an impact is credited. Right. You know, I don't put my name on, you know, I'm never going to be listed as uh, CC over the year, and I don't really care uh, about that kind of stuff, but I don't put my name on anything, and I haven't. I think the only thing that someone put my name on was Fearless Girl, because I, I worked a lot on that, and I think that is, I felt good, okay about that. But I remember Alex Bogusky telling me, I said, why don't you ever put your name on? You do so much of the work, you, you know, you, you're so much of the, the, the reason we've made this, and you've changed it, and he said, listen, one, that's my job. Right. As you're a CCO, your job is to help these ideas that are not yours. Sometimes they're yours and you give them to people, whatever it may be. And he goes, he goes, do you think people are confused as to who's in charge? And, and he's like, I get the credit when it's good and I get the, the blame when it's bad. Right. And, and what my add on that is I always say, if my name is on something, it means someone else's name isn't mm. and someone else gets left off. <laughs> so I, I do think it's important to, be quiet about what your contribution is. People, you know, hopefully you've got an impact, you know, like everybody's like, well, what's your KPI is your new job? I'm like, my hope, my KPI is like, do you feel my impact mm. in a positive way on the company? You know, and then someone else has to decide, you know, how much that's worth. Right. Mm -hmm. But I never try to, I never tie it to awards. You know, I think that's a dangerous thing to tie your compensation or your to, to awards. You have to, you know, try to tie it to impact. You know, what kind of impact have you had? You got to have, you got to have clear goals with that. But I, don't know, I learned a lot from people that really could have taken a lot of credit and, and make sure that you bring people up and you make sure that people get the, the light when, when they can, you know, because certainly people in our jobs get enough press and enough accolades and again i don't like people giving me a toast let alone an award so uh, i don't know why i don't know I'm, I'm fine with with giving it out but i i'm super uncomfortable and this is not fake anybody knows me i don't like parties i don't like toasts. i don't like anything so um but i do think it's important that we make sure the people who've really done the work get the credit 
you know. That's a great behavior of a leader. That's awesome, man. That's the quiet force. Sixth question. Before a caption, a captain crossed an ocean, he or she carefully selected their crew. In the mid-1970s, Alejandro Jodorowsky, a French filmmaker, unsuccessfully attempted to adapt and film Frank Herbert's 1965 science fiction novel, June. Despite the failure, he was able to gather one of the most unbelievable crew, Arson Wells, Mick Jaggers, and Salvador Dali as actors, and Pink Floyd as music composer. Was there ever a moment in your career where you were able to gather a stellar pool of creative, and despite your best intention, nothing came out of it? Never. And the reason I say that is because something always comes out of it, right? right? You know, it's never nothing came of it, you know? There's been times when we put together the all-star teams, like you say, and maybe the work wasn't great or right. we didn't win, right. but we either learned something great, the experience was great, there's a story that's great, right. uh, you've made friends that are still your friends that are great, but nothing ever comes out of when you put special people together. Right, no, you know, something always comes out of that, you know. So I, I don't know. I listen. There's so much failure that goes into our business. If the if the journey isn't special, and if you're not gaining something out of that process, like again, it's easy to say, like, listen, just being able to go to work each day and use creativity to solve problems is is should be enough. What an amazing job! Now, it's easy for me to say in my position right now to say that. I understand when you're young or whatever, you're even mid-level, like it is about the work. You've got to amass a body of work that is special and, and keep going. Don't ever follow the money or the title, follow the work. So I'm not like, hey, just showing up and, 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 and trying to do something and never selling any work is, should be enough. It's not. But for me, I think you also have to enjoy that process. Like what a cool thing to go to work and amass this group of people and try to solve something it it's an you know, we we have such a joyous business and such an amazing job to use creativity to solve problems like very few people get to do that we do and i'm super proud to be part of the industry i think the industry the way the industry responded during this pandemic and how smart we we became and how we use technology in such a interesting and meaningful way and like it's amazing that that's not talked about. The fact that the business is pretty darn healthy. Yeah. And I do believe it was our duty and our responsibility to keep these brands in business and being healthy. I guarantee you more people were looking to Walmart to be healthy and safe and a beacon of hope than they were to the government when the pandemic hit. That says something about what we, as the, the, the agents of these brands, our responsibility. Like, this, if you're wondering, like, it was what we do matter during the pandemic, the fact that we kept help keep these brands healthy and positive and providing goods and services and hope for people and stability. If you don't think that's doing an important job, you're crazy. You're in the wrong business, certainly. So, like, this is a great point of view. It's, like, it's an injection of optimism, and, and we need to hear this because too often we beat ourselves. Uh, we always like, you know. We pump failure into like our, uh, you know, we pump failure the same way like they pump oxygen in uh, in a casino in Vegas, you know, like they pump <laughs> oxygen uh, like to keep like people alive, and they pump failure in our industry to keep people low, right? Oh yeah, and, for sure. Yeah, right? but then like from time to time, like um, somebody somebody come along and say this, and and I love it because it's true, you know, it's like it's an unbelievable industry to work. And we did great during the pandemic, and uh, and we are healthy, like you know, and so like, we recover, and we uh, we are one of those industries that get beat down all the time, right? Lay off all the time, but somehow we have this resilience that comes with it, and somehow we find a way. So I love this positive like message yeah. right now, like you know, hopefully, like you know, we can come out of this like horrible, like you know, phase that uh, we were in. So. I, 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 I think this is one. Of, I think this will go down as one of uh, advertising and marketing, and not even as creativity's shining moment. Yeah, the pandemic. I love that, man. Hey, 
This is the last question for all our guests that we're going to ask. I got, I got to go party. It's my birthday, man. My <laughs> wife's got some, a pizza party planned for me. That's all I really want is, is the best pizza and great wine. That's how I'm, I'm Italian, right? Right. You want okay, amazing right. pizza it's, it's, and amazing wine, and that's it. <laughs> it's funny because, like, my kid uh, came back uh, one day from the school and told me, like, Papa, you know, like, uh, the, uh, there was a birthday party and they ordered, like, Domino pizza. I was like, this is not right. This is not right, you know? <laughs> I'm kidding. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Listen, I'm, I'm positive about all brands Domino's. I worked on Domino's, I know, you know. I like, you know, I'm not, I gotta say, I'm But not, it's not Italian. It's not Italy. Come on, Italy. But you know, it's like, I think what I don't like about Italian people, I gotta say this. We think that we have the best food when it, it's not true. We just have a very good food. But look, no, look, look. There are other people that have good, I mean, I know people now, Italian people, they will kill me about this. But I can tell you that in America, there are certain kind of food that they're really freaking good. Let me tell you one thing. Sandwich in America is much better than sandwich in Italy. And I just like say that. And it's, it's, it's plain. You know why? Bread. You know why? Can I tell you why? Why? The bread. The bread, bread is made with sugar here in America. It's sweet. Sweeter. In it's Italy... Good. The, the bread is very bland. The oil is what is the star, Absolutely. right? Or the yeah. sauce, but the bread itself is yeah. a little bland. So maybe why the sandwich, is it, <laughs> that's a free, I gave you that free of charge. Free yeah, of charge. Man, they're, gonna, they're gonna slam me about this now. Anyway, man, look, uh, for our guests, there is this question. If you were to name the wind that blows your sail, what would the name be? We are the fucking blizzard. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Now you guys play me this. We are the fucking blizzard. Okay, so, and we'll end with this because it's time to, time to go eat the pizza. My, <laughs> um, so Sean Bryan and Tom, Tom Murphy are the CCOs of McCann, New York. And you can't get two more lovely, smart, intelligent, resilient creatives, uh, leaders amazing what they've done you know they they don't get a lot of the credit they don't get a lot of the light but that agency is the most awarded agency of in, in any agency in the world in the last five years and it's a lot to do with them and their partners and the business leadership and strategic place and the production people um so i love those guys and i i will give them as many shout outs as possible because they are really unsung heroes and, and superstars in my in my book so early on, you know, I was helping New York a lot because I was working on um, some brands that were local and I just spent like, I, I really had a, a vision of like, if, if New York wasn't the, the, the headquarters and the best office, it doesn't matter if everybody else was. New York had to be, a lot of the clients were there, a lot of the money was there. So we, we really concentrated on making New York. So I spent a lot of time with New York. So I was invo involved, involved in a lot of the pitches early on you know, my first couple of years um, for New York. So there was an email, they had done a, done, a, done a pitch. And I'm usually quiet, you know, during some of these. And it was the classic email, and Sean tells the story beautifully. It was a classic email like, hey, the pitch was great. Um, you know, they loved everything. We wouldn't change a thing. Go have an amazing weekend. You've all earned it. And to the whole agency and, and um, New York agency. And... Sean had, Tom had wrote, stay safe, there's a blizzard coming, and we want you to be, uh, we want you to stay safe. There's a nor'easter, there's a blizzard coming, and I just wrote back in all caps in the header, we are the fucking blizzard. Oh man, that's, a, that's, Meaning, that's, you know, that's what I call a breaking bad moment. There is this yeah. scene when the, 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 the wife asks, like, you know, are you not, like, uh, scared that someone knock at the door? And uh, she's and, and he answered like I am the fucking person to knock at the door. Anyway, man. <laughs> well, I, I and I just want to qualify like it wasn't about being arrogant or no, but, cocky. It was about like saying you know what in the end like this group together we can't fucking lose you know and I think that's you have to have that solidarity and that you know that that locking of arms and say we can do anything. Uh, no matter who you are, no matter where you're working, like if you're at a company and you don't believe that you're the best or can be the best, you should leave. You know, so uh, that is my wind. We and are the fucking blizzard. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. I wish you all the best. Yeah. The greatest. This has been one of my uh, favorite 
things to do, and I think you're a really special guy. So I can't wait to meet you in person. Bye bye, man. Cheers.